Amen. Hey, everyone. How's it going? <laughs> Good to see you. Well, let's open up to the book of Daniel. We're in the book of Daniel. Daniel is one of my favorite books, a very exciting book in the Bible. He was an amazing guy who lived an exemplary life. There's really nothing negative ever said in Scripture about Daniel. It's interesting when you realize that some of the great heroes of the faith, as you know, amazing as their lives were, they were, they were, you know, just regular people that had flaws, and uh, you know, the Lord lets us in on some of what those flaws are, and we don't just see the good things about them. We also hear the truth about some of the the failures and and so forth. It's just interesting that Daniel in the scripture, not that he was a perfect man by any means, but it's just interesting that the Bible really doesn't focus on, on that at all. He just was, lived such an exemplary life. And as we're gonna see in a minute, what's, part of what's so astonishing about that is how young he was when he was taken into captivity. It says something about his upbringing, I think. His parenting must have had great parents. Um, so, uh, we're going to get into to it here in a minute, but just by way of, um, of introduction, we learn from this book, kind of an overarching theme, is that no matter what's going on in our lives, God is in charge. The sovereignty of God is such an important doctrine in Scripture, and it helps so much for us to just accept and believe that God is in control and God cares. And that's what the sovereignty of God is all about. And we see it um, just so clearly in this book. And it, it makes all the difference in terms of our outlook in life if we just accept that. People want to argue about that. You know, free will and of man and the sovereignty of God. And <laughs> I just say, why would you want to waste your time with that? Both are true, and the Bible makes it so clear. And this is just one of those books that emphasize that, and it's just such a, a freeing thing. Uh, you just find yourself fighting God a whole lot less when you realize that he really is in control and he cares. And I want to start out by telling you a little bit about Babylon and the setting of this book. Uh, if you're to look into secular history, you would, you would come across the name of a guy, uh, a guy by the name of Nabopolassar. Uh, any of you history buffs, he was actually the founder of the Babylonian Empire. And uh, he had a son. I'll bet you can guess who the son's name was. Another long, hard name, Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> and, and he gave him that name because this is what it means. O Nebo, protect my son. And so he, he, was, he was calling on his God Nebo to protect his son. Now, what's interesting, as we'll see in the story, is um, it doesn't really work. <laughs> in fact, Nebuchadnezzar, toward the end of his life, he's going to end up saying, he's not going to pray to Nebo, he's going to end up saying that there's no other God except Yahweh, the God of the Jews. And so again, God is in charge, even in this pagan king's life. Now, before all of this happens <clears throat> in history, this guy had quite a reputation for being a, uh, this Nebuchadnezzar, just being a guy with a short fuse. He, he had a temper. In fact, we're going to see it in, in chapter 3. He's going he's gonna to throw three of Daniel's friends into the fiery furnace. I mean, he's just going to snap. It doesn't take much to tick the guy off. And, uh, you know, they're going to get thrown in the fiery furnace. This is one of the greatest stories in all of the scripture as far as, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. And I used to love teaching that uh, to the kids in Sunday school. Uh, just so many wonderful things to learn in that part of the story. He's also a guy, I don't know if you remember this, but all the way back in 2 Kings chapter 25, he was a guy, he was the guy who took King Zedekiah of Judah and he killed his sons in front of him. So can you imagine? And then he gouged his eyes out. It's just a terrible story. Can you imagine? The last thing you see is your son's being killed by this tyrant king who's taken over, you know, everybody. 
and then he gouges your eyes out, and it's so just a horrible thing. But that's Nebuchadnezzar, okay? He was, a, he was not a nice guy. And, um, and this is how the book really came about. In the year 605, and if you've been paying attention, I'm throwing out dates in, in, as we've gone through uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and now we come into Daniel, and you're hearing uh, the repetition of certain dates. 605 is an important year um, <clears throat> because... There was a strategic battle that took place. Do you remember, did you ever learn the history about the Battle of Carchemish? That was when that happened. And it, it was a famous battle between um, the Egyptians and the Babylonians. And the Babylonians, of course, won. And they were sort of sharing. They were, they were kind of the two dominating world powers. And then, you know, it shifted. And now Babylon is obviously going to be the dominate, the kind of the superpower. But then they go down into Judah, and uh, that was the first attack against Jerusalem. And how many attacks are there going to be in this siege of Jerusalem? Three. That's right. Very good. You have been listening. <laughs> 605 was the first one. And then 597, and then the third one is 586. Good. Very good. And so 605 is when Daniel... Uh, goes in that first wave. Now, he's probably about 15 years old when he's captured and taken uh, to Babylon. Think about that. 15. It's an amazing deal. When we get into chapter one here in a second, you're going you're gonna to see he's got some pretty uh, impressive integrity for being such a, such a young person. But he's taken all the way to Babylon, and that's where he's going to spend the rest of his life. Now, why does all of this happen? Well, as we've been saying leading up to this part in the story, it's because of Israel's idolatry, all right? That's why they're being taken into captivity. But God still has a plan, and his plan includes this young man, Daniel, and his friends. Now, I'm going to give you just real quick a brief outline of the book. It's real simple. You just divide it in half, okay? There's 12 chapters. The first six chapters are historic, mostly, and the last six chapters are prophetic mostly now it doesn't mean that you know there's no historical significance to the first six or vice versa that you know it's it's just you know that's that's generally how uh you know most uh bible scholars and commentator commentators divide it um and uh another thing that is really fascinating about the book of daniel is it is it is so incredibly detailed in prophecy now as you no, prophecy has a couple of different aspects to it. Sometimes prophecy is, is um, forth-telling, in other words, speaking for God, and, and sometimes it's foretelling, it's telling the future. And in this book, it's, it's the latter. It's, it's foretelling, and it's talking about things that are yet to happen, you know, uh, yet future in terms uh, of, of Daniel's time. But there's a lot of skeptics over the years that, that have said there's, there's just no way. There is no way on earth that this could be so detailed and so specific and precise and accurate. There's just no way. And so some argue that, you know, it had to be written later. This is really a book of history. And it's just, it was written later. Uh, some believe it was in the Maccabean period, that intertestamental period, you know, around 170 B.C. But if that's true, then we have to, it just calls into question, uh, you know, basically, essentially, then, you know, you have to call this a forgery. It also, you'd have to call into question what Jesus said. Because remember, he quoted Daniel. And, and he said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, and so Daniel assi or Jesus assigns the authorship of this book uh, to Daniel, and he calls it a prophetic book. So, uh, you know, if you're going to throw out Daniel as being, you know, dated, you know, somehow later, then you're going to just have to throw out the words of Jesus. I, I think it's, you know, we're safe in assuming it's, it's, it's just what it claims to be. So, uh, Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house 
of his God. <laughs> so, question, who's in charge? Right away, you see it. It said the, the Lord gave him over to the hand of this king. So, you know, it's, it's important to understand that. Uh, God assumes full responsibility for handing Judah and its king into enemy territory into the ba to the Babylonians who wanted to destroy them. And so, of course, Nebuchadnezzar, he's a great, powerful, mighty man. After all, as we just said, he just won the Battle of Carchemish, for goodness sake. So, you know, there's no messing around with this guy. And yet, just to keep us rooted in the greater truth that he's a pawn on God's chessboard, in a sense. I mean, God's totally in control. There's a great verse in Proverbs that says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like, like channels of water. You ever put water in your hand? You know, it, it's like he, it's nothing for God to kind of direct him to where he wants them to go. Now, why are they in Babylon? And the answer is judgment. Why judgment? Idolatry, oppression, and you also remember failure to keep the sabbatical year. God is going to get his Sabbath year and let the land rest. Remember, God, God has things he set up and instituted for his, his kids to follow, and they didn't do it. They just didn't do it. And so for 70 years, they're placed in this foreign land. But there's another reason. It's not just judgment. It is that God is going to compare this, this exemplary life of Daniel to the pagan king. And in the process, this pagan king is going to come to the place where he's praying, even making it a royal decree that nobody goes after any other god except the god of Daniel. I mean, there's also a few things that are going to happen in, in the meantime, but basically, I mean, he's, in other words, God's going to bring glory to himself. But there's a third reason that I want you to keep in mind, and it is so that we can get this masterpiece of prophecy. We could not even rightly interpret or understand the book of Revelation if it weren't for this book right here. It's, so it's, that's one of the, the purposes of, of why God is bringing all of this to pass, it's important to understand. <clears throat> Whenever we are in trouble, I know it's probably you guys, but I mean, I'm talking about people down in Texas when I say we. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> you know when, when, whenever people in Texas are in trouble and things aren't going very well, that's when they question God. We don't ever do that, but they do, and we can pray for them. So, uh, but is it, I, I trust you know my tongue is firmly in my cheek. <laughs> You know, we just do this. How could God allow me to suffer, you know? And why is this happening? And I know he allows other people to suffer. You know, I can believe in a God that allows suffering, short-term, you know, evil for long-term good, as long as it's in someone else's backyard, right? You know, when it comes to my backyard, I start getting a little feisty. Uh, you know, we start questioning his love. And, you know, whenever there's trouble, it must be the devil. Oh, yeah, it's always the devil's fault, you know, and... Why, why can't both be true? You know, why, why couldn't the devil be up to something but God actually up to something even greater? That's what's going on. Remember Joseph? Remember how he was sold into slavery? I mean, there's this 25-year lag before, between when God said he was going to do what he was going to do and, and, and when he actually did it. I can't imagine going through 20 five years of the kind of drama that he went through, sold into slavery and found himself in prison, unjustly accused and all this stuff going on. Do you remember what he said at the end of his life? What God intended for evil, or what you intended for evil, rather, to his evil brothers. He said, God intended it for good. His heart was full of forgiveness and grace. But you know, it, it, took, it takes time for God to do what he's going to do. And have you ever noticed God doesn't seem to be in a, in a big hurry? <laughs> it makes me so mad sometimes. <laughs> hurry up, God. <sighs> I'm trying to trust you, but you're just taking too long. And so, anyway, God's in charge even in bad times. So go down to verse uh, 6. Uh, so 
Uh, now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And uh, to them, the chief of the eunuchs gave the names. Gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. When I was a little boy, my mom used to say, say or my nana used to say, uh, when she'd babysit and we'd have, to, we'd have to go to bed, she'd say, she'd say, now, she called it, uh, uh, shake the bed, make the bed, and into bed we go. <laughs> and so, just kind of funny. Um, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, one, uh, here's the thing. One, one of a person's most uh, kind of private and personal possessions is his or her name. Isn't that true? It's just something all of us appreciate it when someone remembers our name. And when you steal a person's name, you really are robbing that person of their identity. And, the old, and that's the point here. The whole idea here is to strip them of any spiritual identity of the past and give them this new uh, sort of pagan identity. And the goal is, is to take these young guys and, and to really conform them to the Babylonian standard. Now, we're going to find out that these young men walk tall in Babylon, all right? They maintain their integrity. But the king, it's, it's this, this brainwashing that is going on. It was just standard practice, you know, with prisoners of war, you know. They just, they just wanting to totally, uh, you know, not just take them away from their land, but, but really strip them of their whole cultural and national identity and... and um, and, and that's, that's the way uh, it is. And, and I think it's the way it is for us too, in a sense. We live in a world that's hostile to the things of God. We live in a, a world that wants uh, sort of to conform us to its image. The Bible says, don't be conformed to this world's image. In other words, don't be pressed into this world's mold, but be transformed, how? By renewing of your mind. And so that's, um, you know, something we need to keep in mind as we're <laughs> dealing with culture and media and music and all of these kinds of things, these worldly standards. There's, a, there's a, a slow but very real brainwash that takes place when we fill our minds with things of the world. And, and we've got to be very, very careful. And this is kind of what the, the king was up to. But look at this. I love this verse. If it's not underlined, in your Bible, I recommend you underline it because it's just, it's a goodie. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief eunuchs and the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my Lord, the king, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants." So he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of the delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. <laughs> so all you vegans out there, say amen. <laughs> it is interesting that when, when, you know, when you change your diet, and you start eating really healthy and, and really majoring on vegetables and taking out bread and, you know, dairy and, you know, fat and all these kind of things and carbohydrates. Come on, you got to admit, you feel better. I mean, you just do. You have more energy. Uh, your countenance literally does change. I, I notice every year I go through this. When I, you know, when I start kind of getting in shape and exercising again for the summer because I like to race in the summer and stuff like that. I'm just a blob in the in the winter, you know. And then I, I like and I feel all sluggish, you know. And and uh, and then I I start kind of you know getting my act together. And it's funny. I I, I feel better, but I also I don't know. Maybe it's just me imagining things. But my face 
doesn't look so old, you know. <laughs> it's like I, I don't have the same circles under my eyes. I'm like, what's wrong with me? Why don't I just do this the other nine months out of the year? <laughs> Anybody relate? No, you don't have to raise your hand. So we're such gluttons. Anyway, so, um, so he says, he, he, uh, here again, here's what's going on. So the king, you know, what, <laughs> Not only changing the names and identity, but he also, he's, he's really spoiling with the best of the best food. And the idea is so that they don't, they feel like they actually got it good. You know, hey, you know, this isn't so bad being in captivity in Babylon. And uh, this is probably a good deal. And, and, and then to start comparing that with, you know, God didn't seem to take such good care of me back home. You know, maybe I don't want to follow Yahweh. Maybe I'll, maybe the gods of the Babylonians, you know, we seem to be doing pretty well here, you know, and, and that's kind of the idea. That's what they're hoping is to, to kind of get them to, you know, change sides in every way. And, um, you know, God didn't deliver us and he's treating us pretty good here. And, you know, and Daniel, this is what's so impressive about this young man. Daniel could have easily said, you know, Life's better now. You know, these people got it going on, and, and yet he didn't. He, he, he is the, he's, 50, he's, he's 15, he's a young teenager, and yet he's so focused on God, pleasing God. He's not going to defile himself. He purposed in his heart. What a great lesson for all of us. Do you, do you purpose certain things in your heart? You know, I think one of the reasons that we fall to so much temptation and just all kinds of, silly ways and and just get in bondage to different stuff is is because we don't decide ahead of time certain things you know i i think it's just really important to decide ahead of time and that way when those things come it's like it doesn't hit you out of left field you know oh no what am i going to do i i just don't have the strength to say no or whatever but there's something about purposing in your heart to, to please God and not defile yourself and what a great example for us okay chapter two jump there real quick um, uh, now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I've had a dream, and my dream, my spirit is anxious to know the dream. And um, interesting how the Lord uses insomnia sometimes in our lives. And uh, he's using it here in Nebuchadnezzar's life. Um, he just can't sleep. And you know, it's not unusual for people in positions of power and responsibility and authority to, to pay a price. You know, there's a, there's a lot going on in a kingdom, of, uh, you know, an empire this big, and, and you just can't turn it off. I mean, sometimes... Um, you know, I, I, I deal with that. Where it's like, man, and this isn't even any kind of big kingdom or empire or mega church, you know, but it's big enough to keep me on my knees <laughs> and keep me busy, you know, and my mind occupied. And, and uh, usually I sleep pretty well, but, you know, there are seasons, you know, where you're just going through stuff. And it's like, man, just can't turn your mind off, even if your body's exhausted, you know, and, you know, even if you're drained in every other way, you just, your mind is just racing. Somebody once said, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. So true. Problems by day become fears by night, and so this king has taken his problems uh, to bed. Reminds me of... Uh, um, uh, this little anecdote I heard about a pastor who was talking to a little little boy, and he said, hey, do you say your prayers at night? And little kid said, I sure do. Yes, sir, I pray every night. And the pastor said, well, can I ask you another question? He says, do you pray during the daytime? He said, oh, no, nah, I ain't scared during the day, only at night. <laughs> You know, and I, how true, you know, we're a lot like that. And so Nebuchadnezzar, he was, he was kind of troubled and agitated and scared about something. And so he calls on you know, all the goons, you know, the magicians and astrologers and sorcerers. And, and, he, and they stand before the king. And verse 3, 
uh, you know, tells us so. I've had a dream. My spirit's anxious. And, and the thing is, you know, everybody dreams. I, I've had people say, well, I never dream. Yes, you do. You just don't know it. Trust me. They've studied these things, okay? There's, there's sleep doctors and really smart doctor people that, that look at this stuff. And everybody dreams. And, and most of us don't remember. Every once in a while we do remember. But they say about 90 minutes into your your sleep cycle, your REM sleep or whatever. And then about every hour and a half or so, you, you know, you have a dream. And apparently it, it, it's kind of the large neurons in the base of the brain. And it's all technical medical stuff I don't know anything about. But it's, it's a real, natural, normal, physiological thing. And, um, and you know, that's, that's true for, for all of us. But the interesting thing is, in the Bible, when, you, when we read about dreams, it's oftentimes God's conveying a special kind of message to someone. Remember Joseph had a dream? He had a dream about the moon and stars and the sun bowing down to him and, and uh, kind of got him in trouble <laughs> with his brothers. Uh, but later on, he had other dreams. Uh, the Pharaoh had a dream. He was, remember, he was able to give the Pharaoh interpretation of, of his dream. And uh, Jacob had a dream when he was running away toward Aram and he saw, remember, the angels uh, ascending and descending on is it Jacob's ladder, it's called. Uh, Joseph in the New Testament was uh, warned by God, instructed by God through dreams. And so here's this unbelieving king and he's, he's given a dream and it, it really kind of bothers him. And so he calls the people... Uh, that, you know, it's their job to, supposed to be their forte. <laughs> but here's the catch. Notice they said, O oh, king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we'll give you the interpretation. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're going to make something up. <laughs> you know, and anybody can interpret a dream. You, you know, I suppose there's no way of really testing it except he's really putting in the test here. He says, no, you got to tell me what my dream is. Let's see how... Sharp you guys are, you know. Uh, you've been on my payroll a long time, but I think you're slacking a little bit, you know. <laughs> and so that's kind of what the deal is. And they're like, no, nobody's ever been able to do that. And he says, tough. I just did it, you know. You're going to have to deal with it. And um, anyway, verse 20, uh, 29 um, let's pick it up there. Daniel's finally brought in, and that's kind of where this is all leading to, is basically they're going to call in Daniel. Um, As for you, O king, thoughts came uh, to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. So he's saying, hey, this, you know, there's nothing special about me, uh, but God has a purpose in this, O king, is essentially what he's uh, saying. And uh, so <laughs> um, he tells him the great, about this great image that he had seen. The great image whose splendor is excellent stood before you. Its form was awesome. And uh, so, verse 32, the image's head was of fine gold. Um, I'm skipping over things just for the sake of time. I know a lot of you have read this before. He sees this kind of this big image made of different types of of, uh, metal. So the image's head was of fine gold. His chest and arms are silver. His belly and thighs of bronze. His legs are of iron. His feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Now drop down to uh, verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. And so he says, okay, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you're on your bed, you're worried about the future and you're the top dog right now. And you know, and, and this image that he saw is, is kind of representing that, this head of gold. And, uh, but he's wondering, you know, what's, what's going to happen after my kingdom? And so God, through his dreams, gives him this, basically, it's kind of this array of world-governing empires. And, 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 it's, and it's interesting, it's, they're all in the Gentile world, all the way up to the second coming of Christ. 
And that's how far sweeping this prophecy is. That's what's so incredible about this story. And the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver, they were all kind of crushed together and become, you know, like chaff carried away by the wind. And, um, you know, so uh, later on in chapter seven, we're gonna see Daniel's gonna get basically the same dream. And the earth, but it's not gonna be a dream, it's gonna be a vision, and, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, this time, Daniel's not going to see four kinds of metal, but he's going to see beasts, four beasts. Um, and, and all of it is just basically the same thing. It's a picture of these four succeeding kingdoms, okay? And, you, and it, it's totally true to, to secular history. It starts with Babylon, and then the next kingdom, the kingdom was the Medo-Persian Empire, and then the Grecian Empire, and then finally, uh, what we know now is Rome. Uh, you know, and, and those nations uh, are called by their names here in Scripture, and it's exactly that way in history. And Daniel's going to explain that these, these, this is how it's um, going to go. And it's, it's interesting that what Nebuchadnezzar saw what was an image, or what we would call an idol. Uh, remember, though, this is a land of idolatry. And, and God is speaking a language that Nebuchadnezzar can understand. He gives him a picture of, a, of an idol, basically. And, and uh, it's this gold and silver and bronze and clay and iron mixed together. And it ends up being absolutely, history vindicates this, the accuracy of this. And it's interesting to watch, I think, the sort of the progression, the downward progression from the most valuable to the least valuable, all the way from gold on down to clay. And, um, and it's such a great picture of kind of the trajectory of our world and anything that we do. And it's just kind of this downward uh, spiral, less impressive with each kingdom that comes on the scene. And, um, and when Daniel, when we get to chapter seven and he talks about this same kind of progression but in terms of beasts, we'll talk about it a little bit more then. But it's not these beautiful polished metals. And, and I think the reason is because Nebuchadnezzar is really viewing this kind of as the way, the way man would looking at all the glitz and the glamour and the wow and the gold and the silver and all of this kind of thing, Daniel sees things the way God sees them. And they're just vicious beasts trying to destroy one another to get power. And that's what God sees. Sinful man just devouring one another. And um, so, uh, just very, very interesting. And we see the same thing going on today. Uh, let's look at chapter uh, three real quick. Uh, so 16 years, by the way, goes by. And it, remember, we're just doing a quick overview. So I hope I'm not going too fast for you. But uh, chapter three, um, there's an intervening 16 years between chapter two and chapter uh, three. And, and Nebuchadnezzar becomes more powerful, more and more powerful and more prideful. Look at verse one. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And so, uh, he makes this image of gold. So now he's, he, he sees this image of gold in his dream. Well, now he's going to make an image of gold. And uh, Daniel said, you're the, you know, you're the head of, of gold. And, and uh, you know, there's an inferior king that's going to come after you, the chest and arms of silver, the stomach and thighs of bronze, and all of this. And so now he makes this image to represent himself. And it's, it's 60 cubits. So... I don't know if you know what a cubit is. It's basically 18 inches, okay? And so in our terms, we'd say 90 feet. Oof, <laughs> that's a big, big statue. 90 feet tall and about nine feet wa wide. And it's set up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, uh, verse five, um, where are we? 
verse 5. That at that time you hear the sound. So he sets it up and then he tells them all, everybody has to bow down whenever they hear the music play. So at that time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music. You shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Oh, this is getting good. So <clears throat> they're waiting for the Chaldean Philharmonic <laughs> Orchestra to start, right? And when it does, <clears throat> you either bow or you burn. That's, that's the only two choices. Um, and why the image of gold? Again, it's because he's, you know, he's full of himself. He's the top dog. It was just a head of gold, you know, in the dream. He's like, I'm going to make the whole thing out of gold, you know. <laughs> Let's just get this straight. And so that's the statement he's trying to make. But there are three Jews. Remember, shake the bed, make the bed, and into bed we go. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, they refused to bow. And uh, they said, throw us into the furnace. God is able to deliver us if he wants to. You know, they're just as impressive as Daniel. Daniel said, I'm not going to defile myself. You know, he stood his ground. He was respectful to authority. These guys are a little more direct, but they, they're refu they say, no way. These are good Jewish boys, all right? They know their Ten Commandments. <laughs> we don't bow down to any other idols. We just don't do it, okay? And um, now it's interesting. Over, um, <clears throat> over in northern Iraq, they have actually found... They're always digging in the sand over there in the Middle East. You know, they find stuff. And it's really cool what they find. Um, you know, it's, it's like uh, chariots of fire over there, man. <laughs> it's always digging stuff up. And uh, anyway, they found, they found these brick kilns that are massive. In fact, they're as big as one of our city blocks. It's, it's incredible. Some of them are 35 feet tall, two stories, uh, you know, by several feet wide. And that's how they would make their, their bricks. This is what they were thrown into. Okay, verse 25. Um, look. It, it, okay, this is incredible. Nebuchadnezzar, verse 20, he, he sees not three. So they throw him in. It is so hot that the, the guards throwing him in die. They just get Singe. They just get snuffed out by the heat. That's how hot it is. Nebuchadnezzar looks in and it says he sees not three, but four in the fire. And one is like the son of God. So there's this, so it's a, it's a, a picture of Christ. He's in there with them. And um, <clears throat> so, uh, it, and I love this. Look at verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted him. And they have frustrated the king's word. <laughs> I guess so. And yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Um, oh, I jumped ahead. I'm sorry. Back up. Sorry. Going too fast here. Uh, go back up to verse 27. Um, and it said, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. And it's been said, the only thing that was burned in the fire was their bonds, the ropes that, that held them. And what a beautiful picture that is. What an impressive picture that is. You know, when we go through the fires, when we go through trials, the Lord is with us in the midst of it. And if we trust him and, and walk in the awareness that he's with us in this, in this time, we actually experience his grace in ways that we never imagined. And one of the ways that, one of the, what that grace looks like oftentimes is he frees us. He frees us from fear. He frees us from bondage. He frees us from depending on other things and other people. He just, there's so much that happens when we go through the, the fiery trials of life. And um, <laughs> so they come through this and check it out. They get a promotion. The king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. <laughs> well, I guess so. What else are you going to do? <laughs> These are some impressive guys. Um, <clears throat> so uh, chapter 4 
uh, gets even better. Uh, the stories, you know, as they go on, uh, <laughs> there's an old saying. It goes, uh, you can put a pig in a, par- in a parlor and it won't change the pig, <laughs> but it'll certainly change the parlor. <laughs> and that's the kind of the way it is with certain people. They just don't change. And that's kind of what the deal is with Nebuchadnezzar. And he's so proud. He's so arrogant. And, um, you know, and, and he just goes back to his his shenanigans. But in chapter four, what's interesting is the pig changes, okay? That's, that's what we're gonna see. He makes this incredible decree in chapter four. And, uh, and what's interesting is essentially this is written by Nebuchadnezzar, not Daniel. It's the only chapter in the Bible written by uh, a Gentile king. Just a little piece of trivia. And, um, and, and what's interesting is it's a very embarrassing chapter, this is how we know that he's, he actually changed, his heart changed. You're not going to write, and you're not going to publish something. You're not going to publish a book that just absolutely makes you look horrible. Unless you've learned something through it all, and now you're sharing to help other people, maybe, who have struggled with the same things you've struggled with. You struggle with pride. You struggle with, you know, this, that, or the other thing. And um, so, that's, just keep that in mind as, as you look at chapter 4. Um, but... It, it, um, at the end of, now this is toward the end of his reign. It's about 25 years after chapter three. He's about 50 years old. It's the third time that God is contacting Nebuchadnezzar. And, um, and he, he dreams something. He's gonna have another, another dream. And this time it's gonna be with a tree, okay? Uh, <laughs> He says, uh, there were visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens. It could be seen to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were lovely, fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of heavens dwelt in its branches and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. And he cried aloud and said, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts of the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast and let seven times pass over him. The decision is by decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever ever he will and sets over it the lowest man. So <clears throat> he sees this tree, it grows up tall all the way uh, to heaven. It's so tall that it can be seen from one end of the earth to the other. And uh, you know, all the beasts are under it, all the people are fed by it. And again, he's very full of himself. And it's, a, it's yet another picture of him. And the watcher is basically kind of an angelic being who cuts the tree down. And uh, again, nobody can figure out what it is. Daniel's brought in again, verse 29. And uh, he says, look, I wish... <laughs> he didn't really want to tell him what it said because it wasn't good news. He said, I wish it wasn't you, but it is you. And uh, so it goes on and basically... What it is, is it's talking about how he's, he's just going to be kind of cut down to size. And he literally goes insane. He goes out of his mind. He goes nuts. And he ends up eating grass like a wild animal. And for seven years, he lives like this. Can you imagine? The king of this world empire. And, and he's just like a beast. And the whole thing is to humble him. To bring him low and to humble him. And... He, he just, he looks around at his kingdom and he says, wow, look what I've done. Look how great I am. And God says, I heard that. <laughs> and and he, he just kind of cuts him down to size. And he gets, he gets basically, um, you know, after bragging about his kingdom. Um, and that's, by the way, in verse 28, um, you know, he says, the king spoke saying, is not this great Babylon that I've built for my royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? And while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. 
So he sees this vision, foreshadows what's, what's, that this is gonna happen. Daniel come and gives him the bad news, says, hey, hate to tell you this, but you're gonna be cut down to size, and then it happens. And basically, he comes out of it at the end of the time, verse 34, I lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me and I blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Man, amazing. Well, I'm gonna stop there. We'll pick it up in chapter five next week. But what an amazing deal. And so many lessons to be learned for us. Just a reminder that God is sovereign. He's in control. And even in our trials, he's glorifying his name. But we do need to be humble. We need to be humble. And we all know that, right? We know that. But we can get carried away. And we can start thinking, we're the head of gold. We're just, it's all about us. And we can rob God of glory. And sometimes God has to take his, you know, someone once said he puts us in fixes to fix us. <laughs> and that's kind of what happened. Let's stand together. Lord, thank you for this story. And thank you for... The encouragement that we gain from reading your word. Thank you for the warning that we gain from reading your word. Lord, at any given time, we can be stuck in our sin and just blinded by it and bound by it and, um, you know, and just not trusting, not obeying. Uh, sometimes we can be overwhelmed by the trials of life. And just being reminded through these little snapshots in this story of some of these great truths that are so dear to us, so precious, so important for us to cling to, just being reminded that uh, as we go through trials, you're with us and, and you, you free us from so many things that bind us. And uh, Lord, and then we can just be doing so well for a time and then... <laughs> In spite of the lessons we've learned in the past, we can get carried away and full of ourselves and have to go through uh, yet another kind of chastening or trial. And, and yet, Lord, just like King Nebuchadnezzar, it's just astonishing that you're so patient that even after all that, he, he did humble himself and he glorified you. And I pray that we would do the same, Lord. Just help us to take these things to heart as uh, just another reminder of your amazing grace as you continue to conform us to Christ. Thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.